difficult time when our church buildings are closed, we're still a church. Meeting virtually for prayer services and fellowship. Loving our neighbours by offering practical support to the vulnerable. And caring for our communities. The work of our church is reliant on people's generosity. A generosity that is a hallmark of a lived out faith and a testament to it. We give to our church in a variety of ways, but with the closure of all our buildings, we cannot receive all the gifts that we usually would. So we really need your help now. Very good evening. It is the 21st of June. It is 6.30, so it must mean it's 6.30 praise. Uh, my name's Justin, and once again, it is a pleasure uh, to welcome you here this evening. Now, if you're watching this on our online service, Yate Parish Church Online, then if you'd like to say hi now, it would be really good if you could do so. Uh, there's nothing quite like sharing an experience together. Even though we're sitting at home or wherever you are whilst watching this, it's great if you can just say hi. So, hi and welcome. So this evening we've got Ian and Ruth who are joining us this evening uh, to continue the book of Philippians and most importantly exploring the message once again. Now I hope you guys are well and as we continue to continue our journey into unlocking within the UK uh, and within the parish of Yate, uh, if there is anything we could do to help you through this journey then please do not be afraid to reach out. Uh, the way that you can contact us is all available on our website at yateparish.org uh, or you can find us on Facebook, uh, on Twitter. Either way just, just reach out because we are here to help you and we know that this is incredibly challenging times uh, and we'd love to feel that we can all still help each other through these times. So as promised, there is plenty of worship songs this evening for you to sing along to, so please do do that. Um, now at the end of the uh, celebration, we will of course be taking you to the, uh, the Zoom chat space. Now this is a great place for you to go. Click on the link within the notes section uh, and that will take you to Zoom. Uh, and then you'll be with other people, which is fantastic. People within the 630 Praise group and of course new people as well. So enjoy this celebration uh, next up a few tunes and then of course we've got ian and ruth so i'll see you at the end
shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great oh Oh 
Everybody, uh, my name is Reverend Ian Wallace, and it's my privilege this evening to be uh, leading you through the third of our series on uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians. And uh, it just happens to be one of my favourite passages in the Bible. So, before we get into that, uh, I just want to recap where we've got to so far. So uh, this is week three. If you remember uh, two weeks ago, uh, Ian started off the series by explaining the background to the letter of the Philippians. And in particular, he made the point that the church in Philippi was made up largely of uh, Greek and uh, Jewish Christians who were very much the oppressed uh, group within the, the, the city of Philippi. Philippi was a Roman city built for Roman legionaries and the Greeks and the Jews were very much treated as second-class citizens and were oppressed. Indeed, this whole uh, book of Philippians was forged out of uh, oppression. If we go back to Acts chapter 16, Ian reminded us that uh, when 
Paul visited Philippi for the first time with Silas. He and Silas ended up in prison for healing a slave girl. Um, and uh, so I think that the, the book is very relevant today as the impact of the horror and offence of slavery on people's lives is once more in the news. But there's a wider relevance because uh, research by the Pew Foundation suggests that 79% of the world's population currently live under oppressive regimes where there are restrictions on religious freedom. And by far the greatest number of uh, religious people oppressed are our Christian brothers and sisters. Um, however, despite that background, Ian showed us that the opening of this letter is all about Paul's love for the uh, church in Philippi and his joy at partnering with those fellow Christians. Then last week, uh, Gail explored for us the rest of chapter one. Uh, she pointed out to us that uh, Paul was writing from prison. Indeed, Verse 13, Paul actually says this. He says, I am in chains for Christ. Uh, and yet he goes on to explain how he can't stop proclaiming uh, the Christian message, proclaiming the good news of Christ's love. Eugene Peterson, in his uh, translation called The Message, translates verse 12 like this. He said, they didn't shut me up. They gave me a pulpit. Well, that's a wonderful way to look at being in chains, chained to a Roman soldier, but having that opportunity to, to write letters and to speak about the love of, of Jesus. And you sense that this indomitable spirit in the face of, of, of suffering, which, which Paul has, uh, which leads him to, to talk in terms of joy and rejoicing. Uh, and all that led Gail to ask whether this is the happiest book in the Bible. Could well be. Uh, Paul rejoices because he believes that uh, through the bad times can come good. And he points us to the example of Jesus, which is really what brings us to today's passage uh, at the beginning of chapter two. It's a, a much loved passage and is very much the focal point of this letter to uh, the Philippians. Uh, this is what Paul really wants to get across to, to that church. And he speaks about it, although it's the heart of witness to the person of Christ, what making Jesus visible is all about. And given that it's written in a time of persecution, you might expect Paul to be encouraging Christians to, to stand firm, you know, be bold and courageous and strong in their faith. In fact, what he writes is totally different, as we'll hear now from Ruth, who's going to read the passage for us. Philippians 2, 1 to 18. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act 
according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation, in which you shine like stars in the universe, as you hold out the word of life, in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labour for nothing. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. So thank you very much for that reading, Ruth. Uh, you'll have heard from uh, the reading that, that Paul is really wanting to try and at, uh, address the attitude of the people of God. Now, that word attitude has got a bit of a, a reputation recently, hasn't it? Uh, which can sometimes suggest negative aspects. So you hear people, you know, that child's got attitude or, you know, got an attitude problem. And of course, they're using that to mean that they've got a bad attitude. But actually, attitude is neutral. We all have an, an attitude and there can be good attitude as well as bad attitude. It just really means our mental disposition based on our values and what we believe to be important. In short, it's a sort of mental posture. Now, you can tell an awful lot uh, about a person from their posture, particularly their, their physical posture. Uh, we're going to show you a few pictures now where you can see people uh, in, in certain poses and, and their posture tells you certain things about them, either that they're, that, that they're spoiling for a fight or that they're angry and want to protest or that they just want to love you and hug you. That's all communicated just through their, their body language and their posture. Uh, but external posture or body language is actually a reflection of what is going on inside, that internal posture or attitude. And that is that what governs how we behave. And that's where Paul is really wanting to focus his attention in this passage. And he does so from the perspective that the truest and most powerful witness to Jesus comes not from individual witness, but from the witness of the community of the faith together, how we live together and treat one another, what our attitude is towards one another. Paul is very aware that this fledgling community of faith could so easily be destroyed by selfish ambition and vanity and pride and greed leading to power struggles. Indeed, you've already seen some examples of that within the early church. I don't know if you remember, but about five weeks ago, we were looking at the, uh, the early chapters of the book of Acts and we read the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And if you remember, they wanted credit for being sacrificial in their giving, when actually what they'd done was pull the wool over the eyes of their brothers and sisters in Christ. And we know as well that uh, this whole question of uh, pride and conceit and, and, and arrogance was um, uh, the source of a problem for the church in Corinth. And Paul writes two long letters to try and address those relationships between uh, different members of the Christian community. So it's how we behave together that provides the strongest uh, witness. But sadly, that the, the problems of uh, vain pride and, and conceit and um, uh, 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 other things like that, they remain a danger in today's church, which is why this passage is so important. Our attitude is all important. So Paul jumps straight in with a question. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, OK, well, think about it, you know, you're united with Christ. So, so what does that mean in your life? I'm interested by the fact that he doesn't look outward to the forces of oppression and persecution. He starts by looking inward and he knows that if we adopt the right posture, 
It will help us to deal with whatever the world wishes to throw at us. And it can also help us to be true to ourselves as God's family, united by Christ. So Paul starts by talking about the encouragement and the comfort and the fellowship that flows from being united in Christ, knowing his love and being in fellowship with the Spirit. Now, the importance of this oneness in Christ is the foundation stone of this whole passage. Paul pleads with the Philippians uh, to be like-minded and have the same love and be one in spirit and purpose. Eugene Peterson in in the message puts it this way, uh, beautifully simple and blunt. He says, do me a favour, agree with one another, love each other uh, and be deep spirited friends. You can't really put it much clearer than that, can you? Now, I believe that these qualities are key to being an effective church community witnessing to Christ. But sadly, we don't always find these attitudes within the churches. Instead, human nature often gets in the way and you can see factionalism and self-centred ambition to have it my way, you know, just the way I want it. Or vain conceit and pride and arrogance that says, you know, I got things right and that means that everything, everyone else is wrong. Or that I'm somehow more deserving than others. Not so. All of that is a lie. For, as Paul says elsewhere in another letter to the church in Rome, all of us have sinned. All of us. There's not one of us who hasn't. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So not one of us is in a better position than the other. We're all in the same boat. And if somehow you're thinking, I know it all or I'm, I'm better than others, then your attitude, that, that posture, that position that you adopt is wrong. So in the context of encouraging uh, the Philippians to be one in spirit and purpose, Paul turns to this question of attitude or internal posture so that, again, as Eugene Peterson puts it, we might provide the people with a glimpse of good living and of the living God. That's what it's all about, isn't it? Making Jesus visible by helping them, people to see what it means in our lives. So what is this all-important posture or attitude that Paul wants us to have? Is he looking for more boldness or courage or putting ourselves forward so that we make sure that we're visible? No, not at all. In fact, on the contrary, the attitude that Paul is encouraging us to have is humility. Humility? That's not a very popular attitude in today's world, is it? But Paul isn't plucking this out of thin air. He says it's modelled on the example of Jesus himself in emptying himself for our sakes on the cross. The concept of humbling ourselves is woven right through this passage. You see it in verse 3 where Paul says, be humble. Then in verse 7 he points to the example of Jesus who made himself nothing. And then verse 8, talking about Jesus humbled himself to death on the cross. He always tracks back to this example of Jesus, putting our interests above his own security and comfort. And we too are to consider others more important than ourselves. Now, that is incredibly countercultural. It's not actually the way most people behave today. I suspect it's always been countercultural throughout history, but it certainly is so in our age. We live in a status conscious age where, where people grasp and cling to that sense of self, any sense of self importance that they can find. Celebrity and fame culture is all about finding worth in human adoration. And the trouble is, so much of self-centred importance is based on putting others down. You know, the whole distinction between A-list celebrities, B-list celebrities, E-list celebrities, I think is pernicious because it's all about saying, I'm better and more important than you are. 
Our social debate on social media and other forums these days is increasingly framed in, in these terms. You know, I am so convinced that I'm right and if you disagree with me, you must be wrong. Therefore, if, you know, if you're wrong, you merit abuse or, or being no platformed. You know, that's the practice in universities where they won't allow people who they disagree with to speak. You're not even worth listening to. And we've seen a viciousness in the debate around Brexit and transgender issues. And then in recent days between the, the, the Black Lives Matter movements and the, the English Defence League. And all of that is, seems to me completely counter to what Paul is, is arguing and are encouraging us. I believe we've also seen a, a distortion of the human rights agenda. I, I firmly believe that the, that the idea of human rights is based on Christian principles, but it's been distorted by becoming all about my rights rather than being about our rights together as human beings together. So all of this in modern culture is the exact opposite of what Paul is calling us to. The call of Paul is to be different, to be distinct, not to grasp at status, but to consider others more important than ourselves, which means listening to them and acting in service on their behalf. Now, that's very different from false modesty. What we're talking about here is the humility that leads to true sacrificial service. In 1556, the Reformation historian George, sorry, Gordon Rupp reported on the defrocking of Thomas Cranmer. Now, Thomas Cranmer had been Archbishop of Canterbury under Henry VIII and had uh, led the move from the Catholic Church to become the Church of England. We have him to thank for the prayer book originally. But by 1556, Henry VIII had died and Mary Tudor had come to office, uh, had come to the, the, the throne and immediately removed Thomas Cranmer from office. And he was uh, humiliated, uh, sorry, humiliatingly defrocked in public before eventually being burned at the stake. And Gordon Rupp, this historian, reports that when all his last robes had been taken off him, the official robes of, of office as he was defrocked, that Cranmer was found standing there in pauper's clothes, which he'd been wearing underneath, as a continual reminder of who he was. So I think there are echoes in Cranmer's life of, of Mother Teresa as well and the Sisters of Mercy. But what about us when all is stripped away. What will people find? Will they find that humility that they found in Cranmer, standing there in his pauper's clothes? Will they find that same love of Jesus for all people, that oneness of spirit of purpose? Will they find that we're willing to spend ourselves on behalf of others, putting the interests of others first? Because if that is what they find at the root of our being, as our core values and that inner posture, then there's a promise that goes with it. Paul reminds us that it was because Jesus humbled himself to death on the cross that God exalted him to the highest place. So too, we are promised that if we hold out the word of life in humility, in other words, making Jesus visible, that we will shine like stars in the midst of what Paul describes as a crooked and depraved generation. Isn't that a wonderful picture of God's people shining like stars in the midst of the generation? And Paul sees all of this as evidence of God's work in us to will and to act according to his purpose. All too often the witness of the church across the centuries has been one of seeking power and declaring we're right and you're wrong. And I believe that unfortunately the witness of the church has been diminished as a result. But what Paul is saying here is that our most effective witness will be as a community of faith, living among the people who we've been called to serve in an attitude of humility and service after the example of Christ, 
which will make God's love and goodness known. In other words, making Jesus visible in humility, because humility was one of the defining characteristics of Jesus' ministry. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this amazing passage, just reminding us of the humility of your Son in being willing to give up everything for us so that we might thrive. Lord, help us to have the same attitude as is in Christ Jesus, that attitude of humility and service, considering the interests of others as more important than our own. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Jesus, the name above every other Jesus, the only one who could ever sing. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you.
them who were slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave praise i hope you enjoyed it uh, we do love to appreciate your feedback so if you did enjoy this evening then please do let us know um, but most importantly i hope it reached out to you uh, and there was some part of uh, ian's sermon that really resonated with you because that's really important to us that we do that even though we are uh, currently physically distant and we can't really see each other as often as we'd like it's really important that whatever service we do it reaches out to you all so, most importantly, I hope you enjoyed this evening, and if you've got time, then click on the notes section, click on the Zoom link, and I'll see you there. But if not, I'll see you next week. God bless. <laughs>